starving to death because of a great drought in Jerusalem. Uh, Paul had utilized Titus uh, to make a collection for the saints. That's over in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 8. And he had also sent him uh, to the church at Crete. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at today about what he did when he went to the church at Crete uh, to set him uh, to, to take care of some things uh, that hadn't been taken care of before uh, that needed to be finished. He's also used him to send him to Yugoslavia or Dalmatia at that time uh, to work in the churches there. So Paul, who had gone through as an apostle and as a missionary and had started a bunch of churches, now those churches needed uh, different things to keep them going properly, to keep them headed in the right direction, to help them grow as churches. And so he utilized guys like uh, uh, Onesiphorus, and he used Titus, and he used Timothy, and different guys, and Luke, to send back to those different churches to help them along so that they would grow in the proper direction. Some of them did, and some of them did not. Crete had some problems. Everybody knows, I think, where Crete is. Crete is an island that's just south. Uh, it's one of the many uh, Greek islands, but it's just south. It's the largest island south of, uh, of uh, the uh, the. Uh, uh, continent there of, uh, of Greece, uh, the country there of Greece. And uh, so he had sent Titus uh, to that location. So what I want to do to begin today, I want to ask you a question. Uh, a lot of you are from different churches, amen? Is anybody from a Southern Baptist church originally? Okay, we got two from Southern Baptist churches originally. Uh, any from Methodist churches originally? All right, how about Catholic churches originally? or uh, yeah, Presbyterian, or uh, uh, Apostolic churches, or... Uh, all right, so, here's the deal. What did you call your pastor? You see, in the church today, sometimes you hear a pastor called pastor. Sometimes you hear him called brother. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as elders. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as bishops. Who's ever heard a pastor referred to as a bishop before? Yeah, don't refer to me as a bishop, although I am technically a bishop. Don't, I don't want to be called Bishop John or anything like that, so that's okay. Uh, and the question is this morning, why? Where did all those names come from? What do those names mean? How did God, now listen now, here's the key. How did God set up His New Testament church to be run? And that's the key. Because what we're trying to do here, my job is to teach you what the Word says. My job is not to... Uh, to make you a, a good Southern Baptist. My job is to help make you a good Christian because you understand how things are supposed to be from the Word. Amen? So what we're going to look at today uh, is the role of the elder bishop, pastor, all those kind of rolled into one, uh, their job in the church and your relationship to them in the church and why that is a big deal. Because, you see, let's read here in Titus. Look at Titus uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For this cause I left you in Crete, Titus, that you should set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city uh, as I had appointed thee. If any of these be blameless, the husband of one wife, uh, having uh, faithful children, not accused of profligacy or unruly, uh, for a bishop, there's a new word, must be blameless, as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, not violent, not given to filthy lucre, uh, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men or good people, sober-minded, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able to, uh, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, to exhort and to confute the opposers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert, uh, subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not to teach for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttonous. This testimony is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men, and turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. 
but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and to every good work reprobate. So let's begin here and let's take a look. Verse 5 says, Titus has been sent to Crete by Paul to take care of some unfinished business. And that, that business is to ordain elders in every city. So let's just stop right there. First of all, when a person is called to be a preacher, uh, that's what we call it in Southern Baptist, or called to be a pastor, or called to be a leader, or called to be a teacher in the church, he is called by God to do those things. He is gifted by the Holy Spirit to do those things. That's step one. A man is called, a man is gifted. Okay? However, being an elder in the church is a church office. you got to get that. Everybody say church office. There's only two church offices in the Bible, in the New Testament. One is the office of elder, and two is the office of deacon. Those, that's the only two. There's not any more than that. Somebody can be an evangelist, that's not a church office. Somebody can be a missionary, that's not a church office. Somebody can be a preacher, that's not a church office. Although I get called preacher a lot. Uh, I am a preacher, but that's not a church office. The two offices are elder and deacon. I am an elder. Horatio, Greg, they're deacons. That's the two church offices, elder and deacon. What are the two church offices? You tell me. Correct. And that's important to remember because in the Bible, now watch this. In the Bible, the only qualifications for anyone in the Bible serving are for those two offices. We just read the qualifications for an elder when we're preaching on deacons one Sunday. Uh, we'll be over in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and the qualifications are our deacons. Our deacons are over there. But there's no qualifications in the Bible for someone that wants to be an evangelist. There's no qualifications in the Bible for somebody that's going to be a missionary. There's no qualifications in the Bible for somebody that's going to be a Sunday school teacher. So the qualifications listed in the Bible are just for those folks that are going to fill those two offices, either an elder or a deacon. Now that's important to remember because there, there are those people in the church. Now watch this now. There are those people in the church today uh, on one side of the equation that will say, women can't preach. They can't preach. Women can't be preachers. Why not? Well, the Bible says so. Where does it say in the Bible that a woman can't be a preacher? The answer is, nowhere. Because the qualifications given in the Bible are for what? Elders and deacons, not for preachers. Well, a woman can't be a missionary. Why not? Well, because they just can't. Where is that in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. So a woman can be a missionary. A woman can't be a chaplain in the hospital. Why not? Because it's in the Bible. No, it's not. The only qualifications given in the Bible are for what? Elder and deacons. All right, now let's flip to the other side of the coin. Can women be pastors of churches? The answer is according to the Bible, not according to Brother Don, but according to the Bible, the answer is no. Can women be deacons according to the Bible? And the answer is no. So those two offices in the church, elders and deacons, are set aside for men. But every other service in the church, whether it be evangelist, missionary, chaplain, teacher, whatever, those are wide open and there are no pre-qualifications for those. But brothers and sisters, when it says under the qualifications for an elder and it says under the qualifications for a deacon that they have to be the husband and leader of one wife, Huni in the Greek, that's what it means, the husband of one wife. And it's really difficult for a woman to be the husband of one wife. Amen? And so, in other words, the two offices in the church, elder and deacon, are reserved to men. Everything else, all the other special services in the, in the church are wide open to whoever, whoever God calls and God gifts to do those. So, I, I hope everybody understands that because what's happened is, is a whole lot of people have taken those requirements for deacons and for elders and applied those to everything that people do in, in, in relates to church preaching and service and, that, and that's not applicable. And then there's those other people that go on the opposite end and say, well, women can do anything that men can do so they can be pastors, they can be deacons. According to the Bible, they cannot. 
But according to the Bible, they can do everything else. So you do what you want to do. But for me, as a preacher of the gospel, I'm going to adhere to the biblical uh, guidelines for this. And I'm going to ordain uh, men that come up that want to serve as ministers here in the church as elders. I'm going to ordain them as elders. And men that are qualified to be deacons, I'll ordain them as deacons. But I'm not going to ordain women to do that. But when women want to be a missionary overseas or want to be a Sunday school teacher or want to be a chaplain or serve in the chaplaincy, hey, I'm all for it 1,000%. Copacetic, we understand. Now, let, watch something else. When you're called by God to do something, if you're in this room this morning, say amen. Everybody that just said amen, you're in this room this morning, you're a Christian hopefully, then you've been called by God to do something, whatever that something is. When a man is called to be a pastor, and usually what happens is, is a man is called to be a preacher. He, he responds to a call from God. He doesn't really know what it is. When I responded to the call from God, I had no intention of being a pastor. I did not want to be a pastor. I didn't want any part of that. <clears throat> I, I, you know, I, I envisioned myself uh, uh, going around and teaching, and I envisioned myself maybe preaching here and there, although I'm, I'm really not a great preacher. I'm a pretty good teacher. I'm not a great preacher, but I'm a good teacher. And so that's kind of the way I imagined things were going to go. And what happened almost immediately is God called me to be an interim pastor at the church, and here we go. I'm on the road to being a pastor, and after they called me to do it, be a pastor, then my home church ordained me. Everybody say ordained. Now, here's a big deal. Probably 30 years ago, before I began in the ministry, I would have said that being ordained to be a, an elder, remember, the only people that are ordained are the people to these two church offices. The only people that get ordained are elders and deacons. In other words, missionaries get commissioned. They're sent on an assignment. They don't get ordained. Chaplains are commissioned, but they're sent on assignment, but they don't get ordained. The only two groups of people that get ordained are the two church offices, and that's elders and that's deacons. So what Paul is saying here, what he's doing with Titus, he's sending Titus to Crete. Because there's men there that have begun to take leadership roles in the church. And remember, those churches were basically churches that met in people's homes. And most of the time they met in people's homes because the person that owned the home was the teacher, the elder. And usually these elders were older people. They were well respected. They had great integrity. They were natural leaders and they were natural teachers and they had been gifted by the Holy Spirit to teach the Word of God. But one thing was missing. And that's what Titus was sent to correct. He was sent to correct that which was missing. What was missing? They had not been ordained. Ordained is the Greek word pistemi. It means to appoint to a specific office. So, how many of you have ever been in one of our ordination services of either a minister or a deacon. Anybody ever seen one of those? Well, at the end, now watch this. You've got to understand what this is all about. At the end of an ordination service, what happens is, is the candidate gets down and kneels on the floor. And then everybody in the room that's either an ordained elder, like me, or an ordained deacon, like Greg and Horatio, they will come along and they will lay their hands on that individual who is being ordained and they will say a prayer with them, and then they'll pass on along. Now what's happening when that occurs? Oh, through the years, there's been all kinds of crazy things. A lot of people say, well, that's when he gets the Holy Spirit. No, he got the Holy Spirit when he got saved. Uh, that's when he, he, gets, uh, he gets the gifts necessary to teach or preach. That's not true. He's already got the gifts to teach or preach. He got those from God before he was ever ordained. So what are we doing when we lay our hands on the individual you're in an ordination service. We're doing things decently and in order. God required that the churches have ordained men that had been placed in leadership positions in His church. Whether they be in a house church, or whether they be in a huge church like this that's got all 20 of us in here today, or whether it be in a mega church or whatever, 
Those men that serve in the office of elder or deacon, God said these men have to be appointed. And there has to be, now listen now, you're listening, say amen. There has to be a progression of authority. In other words, Jesus basically laid his hands upon and commissioned all the original 12 apostles, including Paul. Now, <clears throat> Jesus had already uh, gone to glory in heaven when he commissioned Paul to be an apostle, but nevertheless, on the Damascus Road, Paul was commissioned. And so were all the 12 apostles. And they were sent out by Jesus. From there, these apostles, as they went out to the four corners of the world, really, they formed churches. And then what began to happen in these churches, the Holy Spirit began to call preachers and call pastors and call elders and call deacons and call teachers for the benefit of the church. And so then what Paul says, okay, what we've got to do here, those men that have been called to lead these different churches in these different cities, we've got to get out there and we have to ordain them. So if anybody ever says to you, hey, I'm a preacher, but I never got ordained, but it doesn't really matter, you tell them that that's not what the Bible says. Because if it didn't matter, then why in the world did Paul, who was in bad shape when Titus left him, why did Paul send Titus to Crete to ordain the people that had been called by God to be the leaders in that church? It does matter. It is an important step. So any man that serves as an elder in a church. Any man that serves as a deacon in the church must be ordained by previous elders and by previous deacons. It is an absolute necessity. It is not an option. It is a necessity. And I'm telling you right now, it's a big deal. It's a bigger deal than you think it is. You say, well, brother, I'm not you preaching all that because it's a big deal. Now let's get on to something else. Now notice here, in verse 5, that Paul says, Titus, I want you to go and ordain elders in every city. And then down here in verse 7, it says, for a bishop must be blameless. So, these men are being ordained as elders, but they're also called bishops. <coughs> and... In Acts chapter 20 that we're going to look at in a few minutes, they're also called pastors. Okay, so there's a good question for you. So in the church, are there three offices? No. There's elders and there's deacons. But the elders are who the guys are. And the Greek word, now watch this. If you're listening, say amen. The Greek word for elder is presbyteros. Ever hear of Presbyterians? They're known for, in their churches, having a presbytery that runs all their affairs. And that's a group of elders. The idea of having just one elder in the church is kind of foreign because what would happen is, is that maybe each house church would just have one guy, but in a city there would be many elders in the city. And that's the way it is in Atlanta. There's many guys in, in Atlanta that are ordained just like I am, and they run their different churches. And in some churches that are real big, there's a lot of different guys that are ordained as elders. Okay, but it also uses the word bishop. Now you see, the position, the office in the church is elder. Everybody say elder. But one of the primary functions of an elder is a bishop. Now the word bishop, in the Greek, the word is episkopos. Episcopos. Everybody say Episcopos. Has anybody ever been to an Episcopalian church? All right, the difference in a Presbyterian church and an Episcopalian church is they have bishops that run things in the Episcopalian churches, but in the Presbyterian churches they would run more like a kind of like, not a democracy, but like a republic. So there's a difference in that, and this comes from those Greek words. But the bishop is not a position in the church. The position is a description of what an elder, one of the descriptions of one of the things that the elder does. Episcopos, bishop, means the overseer of the church. I'm a bishop. I'm an elder, and one of my functions is to be the bishop here of this church. Do not call me bishop. Don't even call me elder, because I'm getting old. Okay, don't call me elder. Call me 
Brother Don or Pastor Don or just Don. I don't care. It's okay with me. But bishop is a function of being an elder. And it means to be the overseer of the church. Whatever happens here at this church, I am responsible to God for what happens. Period. I'm not responsible to you. I'm responsible to God. To God. That's who I'm responsible to. If things go good, I'm responsible to God. If things go bad, I'm responsible to God. If I do something stupid, I'm responsible to God. If I do something brilliant, I'm responsible to God. That's just the way it works. And let's talk for a minute. In Southern Baptist churches especially, a lot of folks don't want to hear that. Now, if somebody's from a Presbyterian background, a Methodist background, a Episcopalian background, uh, a Lutheran background, a Catholic background, then they're used to having elders that are in charge of what's going on in the church. Unfortunately, the Southern Baptists are more kind of like uh, the Americans versus the Europeans. They're a little bit more independent, and a lot of Southern Baptists don't want to acknowledge that the pastor's in charge of the church. And if you go to a typical Southern Baptist church, there's 45,000 of them, if you go to a typical Southern Baptist church that has less than a thousand members, what you're going to find 99% of the time is the deacons think they're in charge. They really do. Uh, the, my two previous churches that I pastored, they thought they were in charge. And of course they're not. The overseer of the church is the pastor of the church. That's what the bishop means. But what does pastor mean? Does everybody turn around and look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Pastor is not a different office in the church. It's an office. It's a description of what elders do. Now, here in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. This is a really cool verse, by the way. And this verse, if you got that, I want you to look at the verse. Acts 20, 28. I want you to actually see the verse. Because it's got all three words. Elder, bishop, and pastor in one verse. And it ties them all three together. Like sometimes if you're arguing with somebody about, well, my pastor's an elder, he's also a bishop, and they say, no, that's not right. There are three different offices. You say, oh, no, no, no. They're just one office. And you take them over to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. And I'm telling you something. There's a whole lot of boys that have come out of seminary that can't take you to this verse because nobody ever explained it to them. So here's what's happening. In Acts chapter 20, Paul's on his way to Jerusalem. And he didn't want to stop at Ephesus, so he went down south of Ephesus, which Ephesus is where Turkey is today. And he went down to a town called Miletus. I've been there. It's a really cool place. And he went down to Miletus, and he wouldn't even come ashore. He basically kind of met with them there, kind of on an island, because he knew if he came ashore that they would want him to stay. And he didn't want to stay. He wanted to go to Jerusalem. So who did he call to come see him? Did he call the churches to come see him? No. He called the elders, Presbyterians, to come and see him so he could give them a last word before he went to Jerusalem because he knew he was going to be captured and carried as a prisoner to Rome. And so he brings the elders together. <clears throat> and here in verse 28, this is what he says to the elders who are assembled with him. He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, the elders, and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which He has purchased with His own blood. Alright, so watch this. If you want to be blown away by Scripture, say Amen. Who is Paul speaking to? The who? The elders. The presbyterians. That's who he's speaking to. Okay? And he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. Okay, so there's kind of a key. Flock is the word poime. And then down here it says, feed the church of God. You see that? To feed the church of God. That word to feed is poimeno. That means to shepherd the church of God. So right there in that verse, Paul says, you elders, you be shepherds to your flock. And that word means what? Pastor. The word pastor means to shepherd the flock. It means to take the take your church, treat your church like you would a flock of sheep. Take them where they need to be fed. Take them where they need to be watered. Guard them against wolves that come against them. When they need to be placed in the fold protection, place them in the fold for protection. Treat your church 
as a shepherd treats a flock of sheep. Protecting them, leading them, guiding them, feeding them, watering them, etc. That's my job. But it also says here, over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Do you see that word? Guess what word that is? Episcopos. And the word episcopos means what? Bishop. So in that one verse, Paul's telling the elders, the elders, you be overseers of the church over which God has called you, so you be bishops of that church. And then also, you feed the flock over which God has called you, so you be pastors of that church. Therefore, an elder is a bishop, is a pastor. That's a, that, that seems, you say, brother, I don't need to hear a sermon like that. Yeah, you do. Because that's how the church is supposed to be run. Elders are the same as bishops, are the same as pastors. Now, what in the world has happened over the last 2,000 years? It's just crazy. I mean, gosh, I mean now, not only do we have bishops, but we got cardinals. I don't know where that came from. No, we got cardinals, but we got guys that want to be called father. Give me a break. No way in this universe am I doing that. In fact, the Bible says, call no man father. Amen? That's nonsense. Let me show you something else. Look, let's look at the qualification of these guys. Let's go back there to Titus and let's look at the qualification of these guys. It says the elder or bishop must be blameless. And that is the word integer. Who in the in, in, who you guys? Which one of you guys are mathematicians? Anybody? What is an integer? Anybody know? I know you know, Rachel. What's an integer? That's a number that can't be divided equal. Seven is an integer. Okay. So integer means integrity. It means a guy that's, that that is beyond question in his integrity. In other words, everything about his life is, has integrity. That's what it means to be blameless. But watch the next thing. It says, the husband of one wife. All right, now, let's talk about that. Does that mean the husband of one wife forever? He's only ever had one wife? Not necessarily. It means he's not a polygamist. He doesn't have multiple wives. You say, why would you say that? Well, in this culture... <clears throat> the Cretan culture, they had multiple wives. Men had several wives. Have any of y'all ever been to a country where the men have several wives? Yeah, me too. Uh, in Tanzania, the guys there, once they got saved, they didn't know what to do with all their wives. And they asked me a question one morning. They said, hey, I got four wives and I'm saved now. What do I do with all my wives? Now, now imagine you just got to Tanzania and that's the question they lay on you. What do I do with my, all my wives? What do you tell them? You say, live with your first wife and take care of the three that you're responsible for and their children. Because if you, if you give them a choice, they're going to choose the young wife. Okay? That's just the way guys are. I can't help it. You know, I'm a guy, but I can't help it. That's what they're going to do. So it says, the husband of one wife. Does that mean that this man can never have been divorced? No, the Bible, Jesus actually gives us a reason for divorce, doesn't he? In the case of adultery. And also, Paul gives us a case for divorce over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 uh, because he says that if a person is a Christian and his wife or husband are non-Christians, then they can separate and divorce each other. Uh, the the non-Christian can because they won't, don't want to be associated with a Christian, Christian husband or wife. So there are legitimate reasons. It means the husband of one wife. Let's just keep it that simple. But notice, it doesn't say that the elder is not to have a wife. It doesn't say the elder is to be celibate. So where did that come from? Think about that. Think about all the problems that were created when the Catholic Church decided that the leaders in their church should be celibate. Think about all the popes that had 25 mistresses but weren't officially married to anybody. You say, that's not true. Oh, yes, it is. That's what Martin Luther got so upset about with, with Pope Pius. 
because he had all kinds of mistresses and 25 children, but he wasn't married to any of them. And here he was selling indulgences, and that's, what, that's one of the things that Martin Luther called him on. So the idea that the, the elder in the church should be celibate, that's not scripture. The next sentence is, says, hey, his children are not to be unruly. So the guy has a wife, and he has children. That's not seldom. And then it goes on. Uh, it says that uh, he must be blameless. He must be the steward of God. That's what every pastor is responsible in this church for being a good steward of God. He must not be self-willed. What does that mean? That means that I have to be, as an elder here, and any elder has to be the same, we have to be surrendered to the will of God. But so do you. But so do you. We have to be surrendered to the will of God in our life. God is in charge, amen? And we are not in charge. If I'm self-willed to do what I want to do over the will of God, then how can I encourage you to surrender to the will of God? We have to surrender to the will of God. <clears throat> hey, listen, there was a time in my life and a time in Debbie's life that we were not surrendered to the will of God. We thought we knew best. And every time that we acted on our own, God thumped us really well, but we've learned to be surrendered to the will of God. I don't know what God's going to do with the rest of my life, but I know this. He's got a plan for whatever happens, and I'm surrendered to that plan. And if you're not surrendered this morning to God's plan for your life, then it's time for you to get surrendered to it. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of aches and pains in your life that you didn't have to go through. It says he ought to be a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men or good people, sober, minded, just, holy, temperate, uh, not soon angry, not given to wine, not violent, not uh, guilty of desiring illegal gain. In other words, there's nothing wrong with working hard, nothing wrong with getting money. It's just you don't want to do it illegally. And uh, so <clears throat> then it comes down to one of the main functions uh, of the uh, of the elder, he is to refute false opposers of the gospel message. He's to be able to. He's supposed to understand the word of God enough that when somebody comes against the word of God, when somebody comes against the truth of Scripture, when somebody comes against the correct doctrine based on what the Bible says. He needs to know the Word of God well enough that he can refute those guys and shut them down. And that's my job. And see, it's like this sermon I'm preaching this morning. Yeah, it's not one of those sermons that, you know, that uh, uh, is not going to give you a good feeling all over. It's not one of those sermons that's going to make you go out of here on a high because the preacher was just so fantastic today. But what it's going to do, it's going to teach you what you ought to look for in guys like me in your church and what the role of guys like me are in the church. And that's, that's, what, that's what it's teaching you is to be good Christians. It's teaching you what is required of the men that lead you. Because there's a lot expected from them by God. Amen? And uh, another thing that they're supposed to do, that, that these guys are supposed to do, it says there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. I've been here now over 12 years. This church has been pretty good. <clears throat> For the most part, there's really not been a lot of what I call vain talkers or gossipers. Now, the, my previous two churches were all these folks that every time they got sold up or mad about something, they would... Or they would... They never say anything to your face. But they would talk to the deacon and say, you've got to do something about that guy. you got to do something about that guy. Girls, I hate to say this. But unfortunately, a lot of that originates with girls. More so than the guys. Although the guys can do it too sometimes. But it's a passion responsibility to shut that down. Now, a wise pastor will utilize his deacons to do that. They'll say, hey, this guy's causing trouble. We need to shut him down. But you see, now think about this. We got what? We got about 15 people in here this morning. 
if there's a bunch of vain talkers in there and we begin to shut them down, here's the danger. If we begin to shut them down, they won't come back. And next time, instead of having 15, we'll have five. Now, I haven't been, been shutting anybody down. That's not why we've got such a low number here. I'm just pointing out to you that it's a really difficult thing to do to shut somebody down. And it has consequences in the church. <clears throat> I guess the worst I, I had, I haven't done it, I don't think, even one time here, I don't think. But in my previous church, my middle church, my last church, I had a couple of examples. I had a man that was one dear friend of mine who got mad because the church would not let him be a deacon and because of the marital thing, okay? And so he got mad and sold up, and so he started going to Pentecostal church on Wednesday night. And he fell into this deception that a person, once they were saved, they could lose their salvation. I'm telling you right now, that's a lie from the pit of hell. That's a lie that is to control people by the church. Once you get truly saved, Jesus has got you. He's got you in His hands, and the Father has got all of you in His hands. Amen? But, there's people out there that want to deceive you. And so he had a few sons to class. Larry was just such a personal guy, such a wonderful guy, such a great Christian, to be honest with you. That he had a social class of about 55 people in it, and that represented uh, nearly over a fourth of our Sunday school attendance. Our attendance was a little less than 200. So it represented over a fourth of our Sunday school attendance. But here he was telling his Sunday school class that they could lose their salvation. So the deacons came to me and said, hey, we want you to shut him down. And I said, I've been talking to him. They said, no, shut him down. Tell him he can't teach anymore. I said, okay, which one of you guys can go with me when I tell him this? Well, I got things to do. I got you know, you know, a lot of fish catching right now. None of them. The chicken. So I went to Larry and I said, listen, man. I said, I know you're upset about this husband thing and you can't be a deacon. But you're going to have to quit teaching that people can lose their salvation because they can't. He said, oh, they can lose their salvation. I said, no, they can't worry. I spent seven hours just going through about a hundred verses showing that you cannot lose yourself. But, but, but listen now, you listen and say amen. But he was so mad that he couldn't receive the truth. Now he's a good guy. But he was so mad, he just couldn't, he couldn't acknowledge the truth even when it's just laid out there in a hundred and something verses. So I said, listen, if you, if you insist on trying to tell this guy that he'll lose your salvation, you're not going to teach another time. You're done. He said, I'm done. I'm just done with that church. And he took his family and they went to the church. He went to the Pentecostal church. So I went to the deacons and I said, okay, he's not coming back to teach. So which one of you guys want to teach that class? Oh, I've got, got, got some other things. I've got other things to do. Why don't you teach your brother down there? I said, you chicken. I said, okay. So I went in there, and these guys didn't know this yet. There's 55 of them there. And the first Sunday I went in there and told them what happened, about 25 of them left and never came back to the church. This is what can happen when you confront people with the church. Because they like Larry better than they like the truth. See what I'm saying? It's a very difficult thing to do. I had a lady that was playing piano for me in that same church. And she was living with a man other than her husband. And I told her, I said, you either got to do something different or quit playing the piano. I'm not going to let you be up here playing the piano on Sunday morning. And you sleeping with somebody during the week that's not your husband and living with somebody during the week that's not your husband. And she left the church. What was I supposed to do? You tell me, what was I supposed to do? Was I supposed to just let it go on? How can you let it go on? You can't let it go on. That's like, that's like all these crazy people in the church today that want to just pound the homosexuals. And if they have sexual relations outside of marriage, it's not such a big deal. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. It's my job to point out crazy. <laughs> 
It's my job. I'm really no kidding to point out crazy. And when I do it, listen, I don't go and say, Thus saith the Lord. I don't do that. I, have, I really, I don't do it until I've thought about it for a long time, really. I just don't. And I can count on my fingers almost the number of times I've ever done it. The worst time. Let me tell you the worst time. My first church. Everybody's got to have a first church, right? It's like having your first child. You really have no idea how to raise your first child, do you, Elizabeth? It's just, who knows? You just start out, you head out, and you hope you do the right thing, and you scar them for life. You know, my oldest child, he scarred for life because he was the first child, the oldest, the oldest child. But anyhow, my first church, I went there not knowing much, not knowing anything. I had nine deacons there. Pretty good sized church. We grew from about 75 to about 175 in about three years. I got there. And the deacons had a deacon smoking room inside the church. A deacon smoking room inside the church. Right across the hall from the nursery. And so by the end of the church every Sunday, there would be a cloud of smoke that would have drifted from the deacon smoking room across the hallway into the nursery. And then I started having people come up front wanting to be delivered from being smokers. Who's ever been a smoker? You need prayer to be delivered from being a smoker. It's tough. My wife was a smoker, and the only reason she got delivered from smoking, we had a whole lot of babies, and she knew she couldn't smoke and have a baby. So I, had, I started being in the smell of the smoke in the smoking room through the carpet in the sanctuary. In fact, you could rub your finger on the carpet and smell like cigar smoke. These guys were lighting up pipes and cigars and every, anything else. I don't think anybody had any wacky tobacco or any of that. They were too old for that, but... They were lighting up everything they had. So, I called my pastor and I said, Willis, I said, our deacons have a smoking room. I said, what do I do about that? He said, well, you better be careful. He says, if you start trying to take that away, and I said, that. he said, they're not going to, they're not going to like that much. So I waited here. I waited for the prime moment. We had a great deacon meeting. Everything was positive. And I said, guys, I got one more thing we're going to talk about tonight. And they looked at me and I said, no more smoking in the church. And I said, if you're going to smoke, you're going to go to that far end of the building. You stand out on the porch and kill yourself down there, but you're not killing yourself inside the church anymore. Oh, man. All but one of them just lambasted. And one guy, one old guy that was on oxygen, no, I kid you not, Bo Stewart, he was on oxygen, jumped up and pulled his pocket knife out of his, out of his pants and said, I'll leave you in the parking lot, brother God. And you can't mess things up like this. I said, Bo, just sit back down and turn your oxygen up. You know? <laughs> I can't do that. I'm just telling you that when sometimes, listen, Paul told Titus to go tell the Cretans that they were lazy, gluttonous people that needed to get their act together. Can you imagine trying to do that? But that was his assignment. Oh my gosh. Hey, this job is tough sometimes. This job is tough sometimes. When you do your job perfect, it's tough. And then we're all human, and I'm a way less than perfect. It really makes it tough. So it's a good thing to pray for your pastor. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, and Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, it says, pray for those who have rule over you. That's what it says. I didn't say that in the Bible. Like that. Because it's a tough job. I mean, just look around. Think about this. Our expenses every month, minimum expenses every month, are about $8,500 a month. If everybody in here today gave $1,000, we could probably make it for the month. That's not, now, that minimum expenses doesn't count, doesn't count anybody's salary or this is or anything else. So just think about that. But yet, you don't hear me preach many sermons on tithing, do you? Because I don't want to beat you up. Because your guys are faithful. You guys are faithful in what you do. But we've got this church to run here. We've got to provide for those expenses. And, you know, most every month, you know, Adam sends me a list of things we got to pay and we figure out what we have to pay a lot of y'all do the way you do your bills at home. Okay, we pay this bill this week, we pay this bill this week, and we try to get through the month. And so far, we've gotten through every month. Except the insurance month sometimes becomes a real challenge because then we get a really big 
bill for insurance or the Cab County water. Who knows what in the world those guys are doing? I don't know what they're doing. You know, you get a bill for two thousand dollars sometimes. Every once in a while, this. No, we didn't. We didn't run the chiller all summer, right? Because it was down. And our electric bill during the summer was as high as it was last summer. And we didn't run the chiller not one time in the month of June. And most of you are. But yet our electric bill was as high this year as last year. So there's a lot of things. It's a really tough job. The deacons. I didn't talk about the deacons today. I, I've got another sermon just especially for deacons, but I'll keep some Sunday. I won't pick on them too much, maybe a little bit, but we've got really good deacons here. But you need to really support in prayer, for sure, your elder, me, and when we have other guys in, those guys, and your deacons. It's a really hard job. You know, uh, uh, Greg and, and Doug and Ron uh, are up here all the time taking care of things that you never even know about. You know, all the time. And uh, it's a big deal. And so, if you would, remember how this works. Two offices that are named in the church are what? Elder and what? Deacon. That's the only two. They're the only two with qualifications. And that elder is a, both a bishop, an elder, and a pastor. And it's their responsibility to take care of that church. I take that very seriously. I mean, I take it extremely seriously. And I'm responsible to God for what I do here. I'm responsible to God how long I stay. I'm responsible to God when I leave. I'm responsible to God for the whole shooting match. I'm responsible to God for what happens here and my behavior while I'm here. And I take that seriously. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for a great day. Lord, we've had a lot of fun today. But it's a serious, serious subject. And so, Lord, I just pray for all those men in the past that have been great examples to me in the church. Uh, that have been great pastors in the church that have encouraged me through the years. I pray for all of them. Some of them are gone, gone home, come home to you. But I pray for the ones that are still alive, that this morning you'll just bless them and bless their efforts. I thank you for the great deacons that we have here at Brookhaven. They're, they're fine men, and they're work to death here. I pray that you would just help them. I pray for our congregation here. I pray, Lord, that as we're teaching through the, your doctrines in the Bible, that we're being strengthened by that, and we're becoming a stronger church as a result of that. And even though there's not many of us, Lord, and we face great challenges here, we're your church. And so, Lord, we know and we have confidence and we proclaim that we have great confidence in you that you're going to take care of your church. we got to do what we have to do, Lord. We acknowledge that. But we know that you're going to take what we give to you and you're going to use it for your church. So, Lord, we've got a lot of things going on. We'd sure like to hear from Mayland Academy. That'd be really cool. We've got those... Uh, uh, invitations out there for different guys to come and be educators here and activities ministers here and different things. You know, we've got that going on. Lord, I just pray that you would take care of that. We're going to do our job. Lord, you just take care of that and lead us unerringly in the correct direction that we need to go. Lord, I pray your blessing upon everyone that is here this morning. I pray that you would bless all of us. I pray that you give us all a blessed, prosperous week this week. Lord Jesus, we love you. And we praise your holy name. And everybody said, Amen.